this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to chapel. There are only a few left. We're winding down to the end of the semester and uh, Professor Dan Christ, Professor of Youth Ministry, is here with us this morning to share. And we're glad you're here. Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Let us worship God. Good morning, please, please worship with us today as we sing. And you all can stand up.
You may be seated. Trusting ourselves to the grace of God, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Almighty God, lover of our souls, we come to you with ruptured relationships. Breathe upon us the breath of new life. Forgive our sin. Help us to love in deeds that reveal your presence in our lives. Empower us to walk in the new life of the Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. The Lord forgives our sins and renews our hearts. It is God alone who restores the joy of our salvation. Receive God's grace. Receive God's mercy. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. So what if nobody actually took the stage? What if nobody went forward to give a message? Would we know what to do? Would we sit there in awkward silence? How long would it take before we snuck out the back and off to class? Would we still be able to worship? I've been married longer than most of the traditional students have even been alive. And to be honest, I'm not a great husband. Not at all. But I've learned a couple of things in the last 25 or so years. I've learned that there's a, a couple of events during the course of a year that really aren't about me. Not anything to do with me. And if, if I'm honest with myself, I don't appreciate that a whole lot. I'd rather have the focus be on me. Birthdays, for instance. I'm a guy with very simple tastes. Burgers and dogs, that's good for me. Like that a lot. Matter of fact, dinner, a hot dog, and a couple of carrot sticks, I'm good to go. That's like two of the, the four food groups, right? So if on my wife's birthday I decide, I'm going to take her out to dinner. I'm going to take her to Sonic, to the drive-in, right? You get to drive in. They have both burgers and dogs, unlike McDonald's, which only has burgers, right? What a great option. It's her birthday. I'll even let her get one of each if she wants. Something tells me she would not be as thrilled with that as I would be. Not as excited as I would be, because it's not about me. What about anniversaries? All right, fellas in the room. Married and unmarried gentlemen, here is just a little bit of information for you that will help you in your future. Anniversaries, you have been told, and you understand, are a celebration of a relationship between two people. It's not about you either. <laughs> not even close. So if on our anniversary, I decided to take her to a baseball game or a professional basketball game. Again, I would be thrilled with that. It's simple, it's entertaining, it's enjoyable, but it's probably not her idea of a romantic evening together. So what do you do? You see, I have to come to realize that there's certain events that have nothing to do with me. 
And if I make them about me, I miss the whole purpose. I miss the opportunity to celebrate her, my wife. And she is worth celebrating. I think sometimes we come to worship, we come to chapel, we come to church a little bit confused about why we're here and about the purpose of it. I know I hear in my own head, I know I say things quite regularly after chapel or after a church service. These are the words that I say. I didn't really like the music today. That message really didn't speak to me. It's kind of boring. I wish they wouldn't use hymns so much. The problem with those things is they're focused on me. And that's not the purpose of coming together. We're not here for my benefit. I intentionally ask them to empty the stage. Put the screen up. I wanted to give us a visual representation, an idea that we are all, all of us in this room right now, are all in the same position. Sometimes I think we get the idea that the music people or the speaker up there, they're there for our benefit, right? They're there to perform for us. It's a performance, like a concert. That's why we clap after a worship song. Because that's what we're used to doing. Because they did a good job. We want to acknowledge that. If I could have done it, and it's pretty full, it would have been difficult, I would have had all of us packed onto the stage and all of this empty. If I could have figured it out. Just for all of us to get the idea that when we come to worship, we are the ones that are performing. All of us. And the audience, the audience, if I could have figured it out, I would have had God sit right there. See, we worship an audience of one. One. The God who created all things the God who gave us life, who gives us purpose, that is what we come to do. So we sing songs, and we hear messages and attempt to respond to them. We recite prayers together. We say creeds together. We do all those things to remind us of who we are and to celebrate God. That's why we come together. Now, I know that there are people in this room who are not here by choice. I get it. And the reason that King says this is an important thing to do, it's an important thing to come together as a community because we recognize that without that encouragement, many of us would never take the opportunity to actually stop and think and recognize our place in the world and our relationship with God. Several years ago, there's a guy named Rick Orr, and he's a pastor in California. And he wrote a book. It was a worldwide bestseller called A Purpose Driven Life. <clears throat> the very first paragraph in that book is this. It's not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by God's purpose and for God's purpose. <coughs> So the songs that we sing, the people that lead worship, the person giving the message, the guys running the soundboard at the back, and the wrestling and basketball and baseball boys at the back of the, the balcony up there, we're all in this in the same way. The people up front are just there to help us come together corporately, to help direct what we're doing together. I don't know how many of you have been to a kid's birthday party where they had a pinata. Anyone ever been to one? 
Okay, you know those things, right? The brightly colored paper mache and cardboard <laughs> things. You get them at Walmart or all sorts of stores now. And you stuff them with candy. And you tie a rope to it and you throw it over the rafters or on a tree branch or something like that. And there's the crazy thing. You give uncoordinated young children baseball bats and blindfolds. I guess that's part of the fun. I don't really understand. But the purpose of it is, is to beat the pinata until it explodes open and all the candy and all the treasures and all that stuff are there for everyone to enjoy. It's not just for the birthday boy or the birthday girl. So in the time of Jesus, I don't think they had pinatas. I don't read about pinatas in the Bible. But they had these, these receptacles, these jars that they made where they kept very special things. They're called alabaster jars. Now, alabaster is a form of stone. It's a little bit like, like granite. It's very hard, but it's very beautiful. And they would carve them out. And I don't know how they did it with the technology that they had, but they'd carve them out. They'd hollow them out. And then they'd put in them perfumes and oils <coughs> and things like that for very, very special occasions. Because they were so precious, because they didn't want them to spill out, because they didn't want them to evaporate, then they'd seal the jar. Be sealed. And the only way to get at the contents would be break open the jar. That's what you had to do. And so they would use it at weddings, funerals, coronation, those kind of significant events. Well, one of those events happens in Luke chapter 7. Here's what it says. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a very sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at that Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar full of perfume. And as she stood behind him, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. She kissed them and she emptied the contents of the jar. She poured the perfume on his feet. Then Jesus turned to the woman and said to the Pharisee, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. I was not given any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears. And she wiped them with her hair. You didn't even give me a greeting. A kiss. But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not pour oil on my head. But she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, though her sins are many... They've been forgiven, for she loved much. <coughs> what an amazing story. Here's a woman who doesn't appear to know Jesus. The only identifying factor is that she's a sinful woman, whatever that means. And she breaks open her alabaster jar and pours it on the feet of Jesus. And the whole room is filled with a beautiful smell. Now she could have kept it to herself. She could have sold it. They were very valuable and, and got, gained a lot of money for it. But she broke it open and she poured it on the feet of Jesus. I think, I believe that's a metaphor. It's a picture that's an image of what our lives are meant to be like in response to God. We can hold ourselves and try and drum up a reason for living and decide this is what I'm going to do with my life. But unless, unless we understand that the life that we even have is given us by God, we miss the point. We miss out. 
Our lives are meant to be like that alabaster jar or pinata that they explode open and the contents, what the life that God has given us, spills out for everyone to benefit. So how do I know? I mean, how do we know that coming together is what we're supposed to do? That worship is actually worthwhile. That we're not wasting our time kind of singing or talking at the air. In the book of Colossians, the writer, Paul, talks about Jesus. And he writes about Jesus and he says, Jesus is the image of God. In other words, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. And this is what he says about Jesus, which means then that this is what we can understand to be true about God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for all things in heaven and on earth were created in him. All things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. So that's why we're here. When we come through those doors on a Wednesday or when we enter our own church services, wherever we do that, we come together to worship, to celebrate God. To celebrate the life that God has given us. And it's worthy of celebration. We come to acknowledge that there's a creator that has designed things and put things in place with a purpose. That has instilled in us life and desires and passions to be used for the benefit of others. We come here to sing songs, even if we don't like the songs, and to pray together and to hear messages and words to remind us of who we are and whose we are. And then when we leave this place, we're meant to spill out that our lives are cracked open, that the sweetness that's in all of us, given by God, is shared with the world. That's why we come together. That's why we do what we do. Don't miss the opportunity to celebrate life, to celebrate God, to celebrate the life that God has given each and every one of us. Amen. As part of our worship experience, we haven't done this yet. One of the things we do in the Reformed tradition, by the way, if you, you go to a Presbyterian school, that's, you're in the Reformed tradition. Don't worry about it. But one of the things that we often do is we recite a creed. And a creed is kind of like when you were kids in school and you said the Pledge of Allegiance. Remember that? It's kind of a reminder or it's an attestation. It's an attempt to kind of say, this is who we are. This is what we believe. And so today we're going to stand and recite a creed together. So take out your hymnals. And on page 35, you will find the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed, while you're taking that out, is an ancient creed from the 3rd or 4th century. There's a few terms in there you may not understand. When you open it up and it says, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church, understand that that does not mean the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic means universal. That we believe that the church is God's institution for the world. We recite this creed because it reminds us of, again, of who we are and whose we are. And all the things that make the Christian life and the Christian faith unique. 
Now generally when we recite this, we turn and face the cross. And I realize some of you will not have this memorized. And this is the Reformed tradition, so there's some different words in there. So read it if you must. But let's stand together, face the cross, and recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can just stay there and turn your hymnals to page 450, Be Thou My Vision, by the way. If you come to my funeral, we'll be singing this song, so this is good practice. <laughs> thank you that you are the creator. That we're not here by accident, that we're here with purpose. And I thank you that you give us this community in which to celebrate that. May the celebration not only be in this room, but be spilled out wherever we find ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. In order to be spilled out, just before you go, I just want to tell you, that one of my responsibilities here at King is the School of Christian Mission. And so there are opportunities for you, all of you, staff and students, to be involved, to share the love of God with the world. And so we have three amazing spring break trips going. 
We're going to Baton Rouge, Louisiana to help with the flooding. We're going to Atlanta, Georgia to work with refugees. We're going to Camden, New Jersey to work with inner city kids. And then in May, I'm leading a trip. We're going to Kenya, Africa to work with the Maasai and spend a couple weeks in Africa. If any of those interest you at all, then please come see me after or go see Michelle Fagan or just about any other staff person. We would love to have you participate. A great way to serve. And now, go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, being a blessing to all you pass. In Jesus' name. Go in peace.